Alrighty. Um, so as a background, I started off as I guess, sort of my acoustics career as a violinist. Um, I started when I was four and played basically up through college. And then I got there and I realized, wow, I don't think I can practice five hours a day every day for the rest of my life. So maybe this isn't the career for me. Um, luckily, I already kind of like science. So acoustics is an easy uh, adaption. But um, I always have like the violin, still stick with it. Um, so this presentation originally started because I was chatting with some of my coworkers about my violin and it's an old instrument. It was made in 1730 and we were just talking about violin acoustics. So, um, so uh, the violin itself broke off from the lute family. That's its closest uh, relative outside of bowed string instruments. Um, and it really sort of came into its own in the roughly the 16th, 17th century. Its closest ancestor is an instrument called the viol de gamba. Um, but as you can see, it kind of took a while for the sh uh, the holes in the instrument to sort of develop its distinct shape. It started off just as like circles. Um, and basically what happened is luthiers uh, were sort of forever striving to make a louder instrument. Uh, older lutes are not that loud. So over time, they sort of naturally through tri trial and error found out that by changing the shapes of the, the holes in the instrument, you got a louder instrument over time. And here's Katie, a picture. Can I interrupt you for just a second? Does your mm -hmm. boom straighten out at all? We're getting a lot of breath noise, pop noise from you. Oh no. Uh, straighten it a tiny bit, maybe. Better? Maybe. Let's try it. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I was no going to say, if you move it down closer to your chin, you might get less of that. Just a thought. How about this? Talk for just a second. It sounded real thin now. Uh, testing. One, two, three. Yeah, that's real thin. Move it up just a tiny bit. Too much. Well, yeah, try that. How about this? Testing. One, two, three. Better? Works. No pop anyway. All righty. We'll try that. We live with that. Thanks. Um, so this is the violin's closest living ancestor. It's called the viol de gamba. Um, they're about the size of a viola, um, if you're familiar with that. They're a little bit bigger. They're you can still find people who play them. They they range from five to six strings on average. Uh, you play them a bit like a cello. You rest the, the viol de gamba on your knee and you'll bow it like that. It's They're not generally big enough to, to reach the floor. They're also not consistent in size, so you find some that are a little bigger or smaller than others. They they have a very warm, mellow sound to them. Uh, hey, Katie, am I mm -hmm. seeing seven strings on this one? Yeah, that does look I like can't. seven. I think five to six are at, was what I knew as average, but... I don't see why you couldn't have seven, honestly. This is also actually the split off point for um, in the modern orchestra, you have the violin, viola, and the cello, and then of course the standing bass. At this point, this is where the bass separated off as well. The violin, the viola, and the cello are considered part of the same musical family. They have the same body and they use the same acoustic ratios when you're designing the instruments. Uh, the bass is not actually directly related to them, even though you would think it was. Um, it's also tuned differently. The violin, viola, and the cello are tuned in fifths, and the bass is tuned in fourths. So over time, the bow changed a lot, too. Uh, they started off more like this. It's a more simple design. Um, eventually, they changed to sort of get this inverted shape that you see here. The The reason for this is that um, it's easier to control the bow that way with a modern bow. These older shapes, which had sort of, were much easier when you were doing an up bow. Uh, so the you weren't having sort of an equal strength in your strokes. You'd go up on the violin and you'd get a lot of power um, and it would sort of fly off. But when you're doing a down bow, you can maintain better contact with the instrument. So it was very uneven. And actually, when you see period uh, performances with 
violins uh, from the Baroque period or even earlier, they tend to like using these older style bows if they can find them, just because they're trying to match the, the way they used to sound. So if you look at the modern violin now, this is pretty standard, and it's been that way since about the 17th century at this point. Um, what happened then was the major uh, Italian viol violin makers sort of came into and really refined the design of the instrument. Um, Stradivarius is one of them, Guarneri, uh, Amati, those are the big three, but this was really a prime time to be in Italy making these instruments. They all, of course, kept their recipe top secret. You never told anyone what it was made of, um, even though they were all sort of doing similar stuff. Nowadays, uh, there's a couple of theories for why these instruments sound so good and hold up. And people really think it's because um, the trees that these makers were using back in that time period uh, came about during an ice age. So the structure of the wood is denser than what you would find in modern trees. Um, and as of yet, it's arguable that modern makers still haven't quite been able to replicate the sweetness of the violins from these periods. But there's, uh, there's other theories for why these instruments sound so good too. Some of them say that the makers had secret tarnish recipes that they put on the wood to treat it and make it sound so sweet. Um, that's not as popular as a theory. And, and so far, the research really hasn't held up to support it, but it hasn't been ruled out completely. So when you're looking at an instrument, the, the sound primarily comes from the face and the back plates here. Um, here you have the fingerboard, um, and then of course the scroll is where we have the pegs so you can tune the instrument. And uh, the ribs sort of hold everything together, and there's sort of other little pieces. The strings will attack directly to the bridge, and what happens is the strings vibrating will transfer down through this bridge. It'll vibrate sort of side to side and up and down, and this sound will then be transferred down into the sound post where it'll radiate throughout the instrument. So the bow, this one's uh, a little less important, but bows typically have horse hair is how they're made. That's the, the primary, and that hasn't changed. Uh, the strings used to be made out of cat or pig gut, but nowadays they're a mix of nylon and steel. But the bow hair is still horse hair, unless you're buying a cheap Chinese bow, in which case the hair is plastic or, or some sort of thing. Um, the way it works is right here, the frog, you can work with the adjuster and you can change the tension of the hair. So this will slide back and forth. When you're not using the instrument, you want this to be loose. It protects the bow over a long period of time. Uh, otherwise, they tend to snap eventually, or the hair will wear out more quickly. They should only snap if it's a poorly designed bow, but I've done that actually, so it can happen. <laughs> So this is an example of uh, a bow and then sort of the different state of hair. So you do have to get the bow hair replaced roughly every six months or so. Uh, when you first get it, it should look like this. There should be like little scales sort of on the, on the hair. And that's what the horse hair uses to grip onto the violin strings. As you play it, it wears away over time. Here's an example of worn away, cracked bow hair. But here's a fun video of a bow, yes, go ahead, in action. Oh no, did that work? You may need to select that when you're sharing the screen, because if you're selecting, if you select the, there you go, maybe. Whoa. What do you call the, the, is the frog is the little tuner, the uh, tightener knob? Sorry, that, that popped out. What do you call the, the what? The, the frog. frog. Is that the tuner, the, not the tuner, but the hair tightener? The frog is the base of the bow. Uh, mine, mine twists. So I go back. That's how it tightens, tightens the horse hair. Yeah. Oh, 
the adjuster down here. So the frog okay. is the name of the base of the bow. Gotcha. It's this larger piece right here. The tip is is what we call the top of the bow. Okay. So let's see if Katie, that pops you said uh, they have to, the the uh, hair has to be replaced every six months. Am I assuming correctly that that's six months of playing, as opposed to yes, six months that's of six months around? of playing. So if you don't play it, you can go longer between changing bow hair. The hair on mine just is falling out, just like my head. Yeah, if it's falling out, you should probably replace it at that at that point. That's usually a sign that it's at the end of its life. You can tell I'm not a so very see. big takes a violin bit. player. But... Are you playing? It paused again, it seemed like. Oh, no, there it goes. No sound, though. There's no sound for this okay, video, great. so you don't need to worry about hearing it. So you can actually see the wave traveling up and down the string. And what happens is the bow hair is essentially catching on to the string and then releasing it and catching and releasing and this process just continues. What's really interesting is the amount of displacement. You can't see that with your normal eye. That's astonishing how wide that's going. Yeah, and no you'd have can. no idea. I seem to remember that the uh, uh, what is it? Wax? What is the stuff you put your, uh, the rosin? Resin. Rosin is really, yes. I can't make any noise unless I really, <laughs> noise music, it's called noise when I'm playing it, but uh, unless I really rosin it up a lot, seems like. Yeah, you also do that too. It helps the, the hair to grip the string better. Yeah. I can see watching that video for hours under the influence. Yeah, it can be fun to watch. <laughs> Does the rosin also uh, protect the hairs on the bow? Yeah, I, I'd have to double check on that, but I imagine it does because it puts a coating over the hair and mm -hmm. it's kind of a sticky coating to it too. So it, uh -huh. it does help the bow to grip better and to last longer. Thanks. I, I just want to make the hairs out of a rosin. <laughs> Point out these are from the Cat Gut Acoustic Society. Yeah. Oh. No cats were harmed in the making of well, no horses were harmed. Yeah. No, thankfully you can you can cut off their their tails and I think it regrows as long as you don't cut it too short. Would it be from their tails or from I was always told it was from their that tails. Of the cats? No, of the, the horses. horses. <laughs> There's a lot of great names in this thing here. The purfling I'm going to use forever, a lot more. The word purfling, and then the hair mortis in the frog sounds like it would be useful to describe all kinds of things. Yeah, and actually, if you ever look at violin music, they'll have frog notated in the music to describe how they expect you to play. Awesome. So here's another example of how the energy transfers from the bow into the string and then down into the body. Um, so essentially the violin body is working as a Helmholtz resonator. So, but um, that being said, the violin does get most of the sound from the body itself. There is some impact from the strings. You can pick different kinds to put on your instrument. And I, of course, as a player, have my own preference. And there's many different brands to choose from. But most of it, of course, comes to the body. Um, back before, I guess, we had sort of an idea of modes and the like, uh, luthiers used to just sort of tune the the front and the back plates of the instrument by tapping them. They'd tap and they'd say, oh, that sounds nice. And they knew what was supposed to sound right. And they'd shave off amounts if they thought it needed to be. Nowadays, a lot of makers, I think, can will, will check out the modes while they're designing the instrument. I think there are still, though, some old makers who just continue to tap. It's supposed to be a real art. I doubt I could do it my, myself uh, listening. But here's a fun example of just some of the modes of a violin.
Were you on original sound, Katie? Um, it says that I am. However, I'm not really sure that it. Let's see. Hold on. It'll say turn off original sound if you're on it. If you're on original. Okay. Looks like it was. I turned it off. Okay. okay. That being said, that wasn't a critical video for listening to. Right. It's more for watching. That's pretty cool. It's really cool. Yeah. And um, they can continue up for four more. This video stops here at the fifth mode, but you can check much higher than that. Um, I should mention is the back plate is really the key to all of this here. That's where uh, it gives the violin the base of its sound. Um, there's basically, you can't really see this, but there's two types of back plates for a violin that can be made. One of them, they use a single piece of wood for the back plate. Um, and they shave it to the proper shape. The other one is they uh, abut two pieces of wood. There's a line that runs down the center of the of the back plate, and they'll tune it that way. It's generally considered to be better if you can get a, a single piece of wood for the back plate, but I think that's just sort of violinist mythology, so to speak. Um, they both sound just fine, or at least in my experience from playing his own. Hey, Katie, I'm assuming that's the B-A-S-E of the sound, not B-A-S-S? -S. Yes, the B-A-S-E. Yeah, if, actually, um, if you get a crack in this plate, it can ruin the sound of the instrument. So you really need to protect your instruments. Uh, they're very sensitive to changes in humidity, so um, you can get cracks in almost any other part of the instrument, but not the back plate. With that sound post that connects the top to the bottom, mm -hmm. causing the bottom to vibrate, do you have to hold it in a special way so that you're not muting the back? Um, the shoulder? So that's a good question. So. Violin playing technique has changed a lot over the years. Um, it used to be ages ago that you would clamp your chin down directly onto the instrument and you would hold it basically between your shoulder using your chin. That's not a very comfortable way to play, honestly. And um, as violin music got more complicated, it became harder to play the instrument that way. So over time, they developed uh, essentially something called a chin rest. And depending on the type, it connects right here at the edge near the ribs of the instrument. So what happens is you're going to rest your chin, and then it hovers out over the instrument. So you'll rest your chin on this, the connecting points right here. It undoubtedly does change the sound, but probably not as much as like someone's chin just bracing it against your shoulder. Like you say, so, it's over it. It doesn't actually cover it and touch it at that point, as I remember. Correct. It only comes into contact with the instrument just above the ribs. So the chin guard, your chin is on the top face of the violin, but your shoulder is on yes. the bottom part? It of the can chin guard? be. It depends on your neck and shoulder shape. Most people mm -hmm. also have something that's called a shoulder rest. And that too will attach with some legs that connect to, again, the instrument where the ribs are. And then there are various shapes and you'll just use it to put up against your, uh, to hold it in place. So your shoulder is resting on something and your chin is resting on something. It minimizes contact between you and the instrument. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Katie, just stop me if you're planning on getting to this later, but uh, you know, regarding the sound of the back plates and how critical they are, uh, is there, like, what's the status of synthetic materials instead of wood? Um, that's a good question. People have actually looked at using other materials. Um, carbon fiber instruments are really interesting. They can go louder than wood and they're more resistant to damage over time. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they're going to be very popular. 
Uh, the reason for that is that the violin in classical music is kind of a conservative instrument. Unlike a lot of other instruments that we play in modern times, its design was solidified mostly in the 17th and 18th century. And then a lot of really fantastic music was written for it. So I think a lot of people are like, the instrument's perfect. Why change it? So the problem is every time someone comes up with a change, uh, it gets shot down. Violinists aren't really interested. They're like, it sounds too different. It looks too different. I'm not going to do it. So um, violinists are really resistant to change in that regard. And, and fiddlers are too. Same instrument, same sort of, uh, they're kind of conservative in that way. Uh, a lot of woodwind and brass instruments sort of settled on their designs much later in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and then, of course, the guitar continued to develop, and then we have all these modern synths and stuff like that. But violins are really conservative, I think to their own detriment, honestly, because they're also a little bit resistant into branching out into other types of music as well. Yeah, I've seen um, some, like, different not not classical music but other forms of music uh using uh, violins made of different materials i i don't know what they're made of because i don't really know but um but you know i know that they're not wood <laughs> whatever yeah. it is because they're electric right they're something you can plug in so th that's usually not wood i mean it could be but it isn't necessarily yeah, and actually electric violins are kind of their own other interesting type of instrument as well. Um, again, there's been a lot of resistance towards them from violinists, um, but a lot of makers I know have experimented. They realized kind of quickly on that um, you could get rid of essentially the resonating box because you're just going to run them through a filter of some flavor anyways, right? So they'll have like a frame of a violin with the fingerboard and a bridge and like a pickup of some flavor. Um, and some of those will be removed completely. I've seen electric violins, which have a sort of a resonating box, but it's not the full body of what a violin would be. It's just like a small chamber with openings so you can get the sort of Helmholtz resonator going on. It doesn't sound quite the same as a violin but it sounds similar enough and again the idea is you're still going to pass it through a filter um other violinists who like to have effects on their instruments will just attach a pickup to their instrument put it underneath the bridge and then uh that way you can have an acoustic violin uh hook it up to some pedals and run whatever effects that you you'd like but there's some really neat stuff that you can do with violins acoustically that just aren't that popular. Um, or not to say that they haven't been done in modern music, but they no don't seem to connect for, for long. Honestly, I think one of the tricky bits is that the violin would theoretically take a role in more popular music that the guitar sort of fills. And the violin could have had it, I think, but they weren't interested back when that kind of music was developing and the guitar went right on in and everyone loves it and there's no need to have a violin in there. I'm curious, you said uh, violinists and fiddlers, uh, where do you draw the line or is there a line? Or It's just the style of playing. It's uh, if you do folk or popular music you're, or jazz, you're a fiddler. Anything else, you're a violinist. A lot of them do both, honestly. Unless you're on a roof, you're not a violinist on the roof. You're a fiddler on the roof. <laughs> yes. So the violin is a very well-studied instrument. I think part of it was, uh, all, you know, again, it's had sort of a finalized design for a very long time. And also there's a little bit of the idea that people are trying to recapture lightning in a bottle and make another Stradivarius. Um, so here's just a, you know, example of a typical violin spectrum and then phase. And then also their radiation pattern. 
tried to find where this came. I've seen it floating around forever since I was in college, but it is interesting how you sort of go up in frequency. It really changes the in pattern. That's always a challenge, making a violin, uh, you know, for PA use or whatever, or even recording it. Uh, they're always quite in, uh, awkward instruments, shall we say, to record acoustically. Yeah, it almost feels like you have to pick and choose. Well, because you do. Do you have a pickup? That's what, so most violinists I know who record a lot, that's their preference. That's what they go with instead. I use a DP four oh nine. I use a DP four oh nine nine, and it it works really, really, really well. Um, it's probably one of the best answers I've seen to violin recording or play, or you know even micing. Uh, it, it's not much use with full back you know monitor speakers, but if you're recording the thing, and especially if the person's one of these players that moves around a lot, it's it works very, very. Is that a DI? No, it's a little clip-on microphone, a tiny little thing. Um, I have, if you bear with me, I'll go and get it. Um, I've got one here in this building, I think. Yeah, I think I've got it here. I'll, I'll go and bring one and show you a picture of it. It's pretty cool. Your memo. Cool. Katie, on this violin radiation pattern, is that a, a spherical or a hemisphere? Sorry, I'll go back to it. That's okay. There. So is... This is a two-dimensional photo, but the world around the violin is three-dimensional. So in the first case, 200 to 400, does that mean it's a sphere radiation radiating e equally spherically? Yeah, I couldn't find the vertical one in time for this presentation. I thought I had it somewhere, but apparently I don't. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's more a spherical radiation pattern that kind of matches to with how a lot of lower frequencies tend to radiate anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And then it gets hinky above 1K. Yeah. It starts to get beamy. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks. And then I was just kind of curious looking at the violin that Gordon had mentioned. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, that's a fun model. I've seen some that are designed to look a lot like guitars. Seeing and these people use ones like that, that is just so weird. They feel strange to play, too, because the weight isn't distributed the way you're expecting it to be. Do you have anything like that? No, I don't. I keep looking at doing one, and then every time I think, well, I could just get a pickup if I were going to Yeah, it looks almost blast do it more often. There's a, there's a guy in town... Uh, his name's Jeffrey Castle, and he does yes. he does pop. Um, he's got an electric violin, and you know, from a distance, it kind of looks like a violin. There's a lot of mm -hmm. wires and junk that come off it. When you you look, get up close to it, and it's basically just a, a frame. Yeah, yeah, and and he's also the only violinist I've ever heard who uses a wah wah pedal. <laughs> yeah and and he also uses a a looper yes where yes he, he plays into it and then it comes back around and he plays against it right right he's good at it, it yes makes a lot of music I've yeah seen i really like electric violins i think you can do some neat stuff with them mm-hmm I've seen some solid body violins that are like a Telecaster, the equivalent of a Telecaster. That So there's no resonance. It's like a little mm. flat boat or plank with the strings sticking up from it. Yeah. Kind of like the, mm. the cello that, uh, was it Jamie Sieber? Yeah. Like, yeah. That, like that instrument. Yeah. Well, in, the, in the coming presentation, you'll see a couple photos with uh, electric cello. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. 
Yeah, there, there okay. was a group here in Seattle. I don't know. I I think they're history now, called Rumors of the Big Wave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They um the the that was Jamie. Yep. Yeah. It was Jamie and and. And uh, Charlie Murphy, who sadly yeah. passed about four years ago. Oh, did he? I just found I that out that. recently. Uh, he had Lou Gehrig's mm. disease, sadly. Uh, mm. Oh. Mm. Well, you guys have probably done uh, Doug Kershaw, right? No, never have. No. Mm -hmm. I knew somebody who was his guitar the, player, but never worked the, with him. The Ragin Cajun, then? Yes. Yes, he was a handful. From, I think. <laughs> Katie, you should just keep going. Let's not wait for Gordon. Alrighty. Uh, so at this point in the presentation, usually I'd use a live demo, but I don't really have the AV setup at home for that. So instead, I've found some uh, examples of all the different sounds you can make on an instrument like like that. Uh, they're all Italian names, of course. Uh, so legato is the more smooth continuous sound that you hear when you listen to someone play the violin. Oh, goodness. When are you going to let me... <laughs> there we go. That was mostly good. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully this next one will work all right. Um, once so, you minimized it, it was a lot better. OK. Yes. Well, I'll do that with the next one, too. Uh, so another Boeing style is called detache. And you might actually sort of imagine what that sounds like. But it's more detached strokes from each other. So you're going to hear a break between a uh, bow strokes, so to speak.
So that stroke, you achieve it primarily through changing the bow speed as you uh, are about to change the bow, essentially. All righty. Uh, Martelet is the next one. Uh, and Martelet, you do primarily by, you have a lot of pressure on the bow at the start of the direction you're changing. And then you quickly lighten up so the bow comes into less contact with the string. You'll have essentially each change in direction of the bow is emphasized. Katie, are these uh, playing styles noted on the music? Uh, they are actually. There's usually notations. Sometimes it'll say Martelet, otherwise they'll or detaché. Other times it'll be done through musical notation. And then sometimes it's a musical tradition that you you just have to know that is passed down through essentially violin history. This is kind of another Zoom lesson for us is when you're moving, it sounds like when you're moving your cursor or something or doing something, it's wonky, it's skippy. Yeah. And then other times it's solid and then it has to rebuffer or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I mean, we don't have to get into the details, but uh, uh, internet connection speed and uh, I don't know if you're on yeah. Wi-Fi or not, but um, those could be possible issues yeah yeah i can i'm wondering if that's the case are we missing things by not being able to see the violinist doing the thing um well i had intended on putting the videos up so that you could see uh yeah. what the stroke looks like from the bow's perspective yeah that might be the better the more effective because a lot of this is <laughs> yeah it is it is and um and I wonder if, uh, so are you wireless or, or are you plugged in for your internet? No, I'm wired actually. Oh. Hmm. Because yeah, I, I would have thought that would have been best. I'm wireless to a uh, hub that's very close to me. And I'm wondering if maybe that's a limitation for oh, everybody. Oh, see, I'm wired about 50 feet. <laughs> I'm wired, and I noticed uh, I've got the lowest tier Comcast uh, internet, but hmm. I noticed that uh, if I'm on a Zoom call, I I can't say try to upload a file anywhere. It just just sucks the bandwidth, and everything goes to hell on the Zoom call. I don't have the lowest tier, but I have some of the lower ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so they I... just boosted it. Even the lowest one is still pretty high. Nobody's as low as I am. <laughs> I just drink a lot of coffee, so I'm wired. <laughs> My connection is probably 3DB better than a Dixie cup and thread. <laughs> yeah, we try to avoid commenting on that. <laughs> I, I think she's just saturating her bandwidth, either down or up or both or something. Yeah. Do you want to just post the videos and yeah yeah, yeah. i think yeah. that's what we should do yeah um i'll describe what the rest of the strokes are though Great. um Great. just for reference so satie is um that stroke is a fast light bouncy stroke and uh ricochet you us with your hands by i can actually let's see Good. hold on let me pull the video up so i can see or will it show me? Oh, maybe I can't see with my screen sharing. All right. So, 
So Satie, you're doing like a bouncy motion like this, essentially. And then let me pull up my PowerPoint so I have my list in front of me. Is that one where it bounces, where it actually bounces on the string? A bunch it, of staccato notes? It does. It bounces. You get sort of a rhythm to it, and uh, it just moves up and down very smoothly. So a ricochet, <laughs> this is actually very hard to do, but uh, if my... You essentially like bounce it up and down the string with the bow. Yeah, I can go like did 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 did. Yep. Um, Colenio is really fun. That one's when you actually turn the bow over and then you hit the string with the wood. Cool. That one took some time to develop. That was not really thought about as a technique until I'd say the late 19th, 20th century. It's used primarily in orchestral music, I've heard. I think I've seen fiddlers do it sometimes for accents or for fun. Uh, pizzicato is when you pluck the strings. And then uh, you can play chords on a violin. You can easily play two notes at once. Uh, it's easy enough to play two strings. And you can even play three strings at once if you strike the instrument one, right um, you have to sort of drop it in and aim for the middle string and it'll depress the middle string such that the two strings on either side of it will also be grabbed. And it's usually a short stroke and you just lift it up quickly and it'll ring. Otherwise, violinists, what they tend to do is they'll roll it. They'll play either one or two strings at once. Is three at once ever required? Quite often. Is it? Yeah. Um, they figured out, they were probably already doing it in the 17th century, but, uh, in the early 18th, they really added in a bunch of it and realized they could do it quite a bit. Uh, Bach himself had a ton of, uh, violin music where he had a bunch of chords of three or four notes that you play across all three to four strings. That's amazing. Yeah, and um, the the piece I picked as an example of chords actually is a Bach piece, and it's really quite pretty. I've got this microphone here now. Um, I just quickly, if anybody's interested in the thing. Uh... You cut your voice off again. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I've just bust the cable here, I think. Uh, but there, that's it there. So this is on its piano mount right now. You can see it just clips on, but these mounts are variable in many, many hundreds of different types of mounts. And then it's a little flexible gooseneck. Uh, you muted again. yourself again, Gordon. Let's try and do it. Yeah, run, run it out of hands. It's a little flexible gooseneck, so it can move around to suit, you know, whatever it needs to do. Very, very, very flexible little making system. They're not cheap, but they're really worth every penny they've got. It's basically a minute uh, shotgun microphone that's inside the foamy bit here. Mm -hmm. Tiny, tiny little shotgun mic. And then the, the, the XLR connector for this one, it just clips onto, you know, the body clip there. What's it called again? A DPA 4099. Delta Papa, Papa Alpha 40. Oh, you gave the link, didn't you? Yeah, or somebody did. It wasn't me, but yeah. Oh, okay. the, the, the great thing about this microphone system is these mounts. The, the, this is the one that would go on a piano. Harp is at the bottom, hmm. and you just put the thing in on a piano, and it works incredibly well. Uh, but the, the, the ones for the violin go on just like a chin rest clip over the, the, the very edge. And I've not had any um, violinist refuse it at all in recent years anyway, sorry, in recent years. Uh, and they sound really, really good. Um, you can get mounts for acoustic guitars, drums, brass instruments, you know, viol uh, double bass, violas, you know, pretty much anything, really. Uh, I have somewhere in this wretched building uh, a box with 12 of these things in and all their mounts, but I can't find it right now. I don't know what somebody's done with it. But I uh, have these two. These, these, you, you can buy these as a pair for, for, for pianos, and uh, that's what this is. This is part of a pair for pianos. So the boom is a piano boom, and there's a violin boom that would be much shorter. Yeah, the mounts, yeah, the little rubber mounts. So I'll show you. I'll take yeah. it off if I can with one hand. It's, it basically just clips on. These are made of soft rubber, like that. Okay. There's, there's, that's the actual microphone on its own there now, without the mount on it. 
this little bit here is what hooks it onto the mount and get the mount to suit the instrument that you need. Dan, it's something you should maybe have a wee look at. Is the cheapest way I found to buy these is to buy the piano pack, which is two, and then buy the mounts. The mounts are really quite inexpensive. It's the microphone that's the deer part. Mm -hmm. I've seen cheap. them, but it's been like a six-inch boom rather than a foot. That looks like it's a foot long. Oh, it's not. It's it's about six or seven inches long. Oh, better. okay. Oh, oh that's a cable coming off. Okay, yeah, that's got a cable. It. Got it. I, Dan, I have one of their um, microphone mounts for the for the, for violin and it's not a boom at all it's a little uh a it triangular rubber, rubber thing you it say. hooks on to the first and fourth strings and then it gives you a place to clip the microphone in the center yeah that, that's the older one but they've yeah. got these little ones now that go on and there's so much the, the 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 great thing about the newer ones is you squeeze it and it comes off and then you can just leave it sitting on your music stand and it goes straight uh, back on again, so you're not mm -hmm. fiddling with the instruments. I have seen people damage the bridge using yeah. those original ones, the ones you're talking. They were for the four of six sixties little bum mics, right. the ones you're talking about. The four hundred ninety nine instrument systems are a whole lot better, and it works really, really well. Yeah, right, but... a bridge is thankfully easily replaceable, but you'd still rather not oh, to move damage it right if you can avoid it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I do play violin, and I have played violin since I was a kid. Uh, I have a Zeta, a Zeta electronic uh, violin with a MIDI pickup in it, and I have endless amusement with that thing. It's it's good fun. It's a six string I've got, but it it works. Yeah, I think I'm thinking I should just bite the bullet and get one. They do look like a lot of fun. They are. They're excellent fun. They really are worth it. But it, it's like all things, the better one you buy, the better they work. You know. So yeah. I, I have a job for mine, so or I had a job years ago for mine, so I bought a really good one. But you can get reasonable. Um, solid body violins for not a lot of money and the pickups are okay on them they work for experimental purposes they work quite well so katie when you send the links out can you uh include your descriptions of the each of the styles too yeah i can it's not immediately apparent from the names although italian's fun they're usually quite literal translations and have you got, gone through all of the descriptions at this point I did. Uh, I do have one more thing I can show. Um, I did take some pictures of my instrument. It's not as fun as if I can show in person, but let's go back to sharing my screen. So this is a picture of my instrument. Uh, it was made in 1730 by some unknown maker in, it wasn't the Czech Republic, I think it was Bohemia then. Uh, all violins come with a little sticker on the inside. You can see on through this F hole, and it'll tell you who made it. Mine says it's by some Italian guy, but it's a lie. That was really common at the time. It was considered, you know, you just tell people that to, to get good advertising. Say, like, I have a famous Italian instrument. They'll buy whatever it is. It's a, it is a nice instrument. Um, my theory is, is that it's by a beginning maker, because if you look at this, the neck is not perfectly symmetrical. It goes off to the side. It should be symmetrical. Uh, this here is, by the way, the example of a chin rest. It's coming into contact right here over the tailpiece. That's this item right here. The chin rest does not look like it was from the 1700s. <laughs> no, the chin rest is much newer, and actually... This is sort of a, so if you look at the instrument, you can kind of tell the, the varnish is a lot lighter around here and also around here. So this was back before they had chin rests and people would just rest their uh, chins directly onto the instrument. Uh, the varnish on, ins on older instruments are lighter there because the natural oils in your skin wear away at the varnish. So you're also not supposed to really touch these instruments that much um, on the body in order to to protect it, but you can see it here. Um, you'll notice that, the, so nowadays all violins are played where you hold it basically on this side of the instrument and you'll rest it on your left shoulder, but you'll notice that there's some wear away on the right. That's because uh, it didn't used to be standardized actually. You used to play it on whatever side you felt like and felt more comfortable. You could hold it in your right hand if you wanted and play it that way. 
uh, they changed that as modern orchestras and ensembles came into being because they needed to standardize the ways the bows were going so people weren't poking each other in the face. Very important. Um, you ever wonder about the history of I can of see that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm sure there were some injuries. I'm not only that, I'm sure people might have lost an eye over this whole thing. Is there a symmetrical black guard on the bottom of this to keep it off of your shoulder? I yes, I don't have a picture of my shoulder rest, unfortunately. Okay. Here's a picture of the back plate though. You can see it's a continuous piece. Beautiful. That's a beautiful instrument. Yeah. Whoever made it did a good job, even though they it's not quite symmetrical. <clears throat> Do you ever wonder who owned that in be between when it was made and now? I have. I have no idea, though, because it's, it's like 300 years old almost. That's did tons you, of people that could have owned it. I'm sure you've seen the movie The Red Violin. Yeah, I have. That's what made me think of it. I love that movie. Yeah, me too. I was just thinking of that as well. Thanks for bringing it up, Bob. And especially the unique varnish that was used. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then I also have a picture of the scroll. I don't have the best camera in the world, but you might be able to see this. It's really faint. So the scroll is very worn away for one, but it's also been replaced at least once. There's a faint line that runs around here where someone cut away at the original scroll and put a new one in and then sealed it together. Um, if you can't see it, I completely understand why. It's a really, really well done repair. You can barely tell that someone added new wood onto this. Just a tiny, tiny line. I can line. see it, yeah. yeah. Tiny though. It's really tiny. Yeah, yeah. So obviously these, nobody ever puts rods in the neck, right? I mean, and they wouldn't have back then. No, they wouldn't so it's have. It's just solid wood that doesn't bend. Yep. Does the scroll at the very end have any impact on the anything other than the look? It, you know, it probably has a small impact just because an acoustic system, everything kind of adds to it. But I can't imagine it's huge. I think it's mostly for looks. And probably to reinforce the two little parallel pieces that are holding the pegs. That's yeah. reasonably flimsy, but then there's this big chunk at the end to hold it Do you together. think the pegs are 300 years old or are those new? <laughs> no, those are new. And then I attempted to get a picture of the sticker for you as well. You can sort of see it. It's very faded. Oh, yeah. Yep. yep. When was that put in there? Uh, that's original to the instrument. Wow. So, 730. Wow. Yeah, Is you that... need to put a light in there, I'll probably shine a little light. <laughs> wow, that would be cool. Is that Ruggieri or something? Ruggieri? That's what it says. But, yeah. Um, yeah, the luthier I bought it from did some investigation and found that that's not actually who made it. They were only able to track it back to Bohemia. Wow. In, in Scotland, in the Shetland Islands, uh, up in the north, there's a big tradition of fiddle or violin making, and they all make them, they, they, they often end up looking not unlike that. You know, they're, they're very, very uh, rustic instruments. But, you know, some of the older ones now, they sound absolutely amazing, you know. Um, there's a big fiddle or violin tradition in Scotland, and they were all handmade like that. As I said on one on the chat, I had a, a, a woodworking teacher who was a Scotsman, and he came from Shetland. His family came from Shetland. He used to sit and he would make a violin each year, each school year. He would start making a violin at the beginning of the year and have it finished by the end of the, the season at school. Wow. A lot of the modern makers, too, are quite good, by the way. Everyone says, oh, the old ones sound beautiful, and that the older the violin is, the better it's likely going to sound. But there's some really, really nice modern sounding instruments. I guess the, tr the, the question is, how well does it record? In, in my, <laughs> for me. You know, That's one I'm, question. The other is, how does it play? 
Yeah, I would think that would be more important probably. So what's the answer, Katie? Oh, I think it sounds great. It has a wonderful warm tone. Uh, it's not as higher pitched as some violins are. Mm -hmm. And it's something I actually really appreciate about it. Now, do you always use this one violin or do you have another one or two that you normally use that you don't want to hurt? So I used to have a violin in use uh, for use when I didn't want to hurt this instrument when I was worried about taking it to places that it could get potentially damaged or anytime you had a concert outside. Uh, I don't anymore. I, I actually gave it to my younger sister because she wanted to get into violin. So I gave her a, a starter instrument. Very nice of you. Yeah. Cool. But uh, a lot of professional violinists have their main performing instrument and then maybe one or two extras to protect the main performing instrument. Also, multiple bows. Those are usually acquired separate from the violin. The bows are pretty ferociously expensive, aren't they? They are. They're both expensive. Uh, last I checked, a professional, just the violin, starts around 20000 and goes up from there. Um, and a lot of orchestra musicians have instruments in like, you know, the fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 range. Or if they're sponsored, that sometimes they have these fantastic instruments that are hundreds of thousands of dollars. The bows are separate from that also start between ten to $15,000 at a professional level and go up from there. Gee worth it. Yeah. But Too rich for my blood. <laughs> I paid $150 for my violin. Yeah. I, I can't play that well, so. It's a perfect fit then. It's a perfect fit, and I got my uh, my cello from Trimpin. Cool. I have to say, though, um, I think a nicer instrument makes you sound better as a as a violinist. Um, they're easier to play. They have a nicer tone when you play them as well. They and the play same like with butter. Bow. They play like butter. That's a great way to describe it. Yeah. And That's I bet like it because it sounds better. It makes you want to play more too. It does. Or get better or whatever, you know. It definitely does. I was always excited to graduate to the next better sounding instrument. It makes a huge difference. That's a great presentation. Do, do you, you have a name for your violin? No, I thought about giving it one, okay. but I can't I come up with one. Your, okay. The gray violin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I'm gonna have to walk, go watch the red violin again. What's that about? I've never seen it. Oh, uh, you should you should just watch it. Okay. Yeah, it's this. It's basically the story of a violin yes. from the time um, it gets created to all of the people who own it and hmm. and the auction where it ends up. Yep, it's an inter interleaved bunch of events. It's like a bunch of vignettes, but it's all they're all tied together because they're all about this violin. Cool. Katie, did you reach the end of your presentation? I don't want to cut you off. I did. That was it. Oh, okay. Big round of applause. Hey. That was great. Yay, bravo. Round, round one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't well press done. the button and, and clap at the same time. Right. Bravo. Is that the fire behind your house there, down at the water? Wow. That is what I saw. I heard there was a, a smoke, and I opened my door, my front door, to look, and that was Boy. it. God. I thought it was a wow. We we in the neighborhood didn't know what was going on yet. I thought it was the next block. But yeah. Where, where do you live? Northwest Everett. Oh, geez. Okay. It's that fire. Okay. There yeah. have been a few, so wow. Yeah. Geez. Wow, that was what, nice. yesterday, the day before? Th uh, Thursday night. Days, yeah. and my okay. My neighbor, Captain, uh, he, he's on, been on vacation for the last week. He had to go down and join them. Wow. Wow, amazing. I took, I, I took quite a few pictures around the neighborhood. Good. 
Well, before we start on uh, Luke's presentation, do you want to talk about next week? At, at this moment, uh, God, I should have looked <laughs> at my schedule. Uh, is it Tom who's scheduled next week or somebody else? I'm, I'm doing the Seattle Pops Festival, and I was going to ask Bob if you want to contribute that to that. You've got some pictures. Have you found any more? Whoop, you're off, you're off, you're off, you're off, you're off. Oops, you're I just, I have all my pictures, my negatives. I haven't scanned them all. Okay. Uh, but, you know, a lot of them are just people and the stage. Um, yeah. There's, um, in fact, I should put back my, uh, my picture. But Yeah, that one is terrific. That one is fantastic. Yeah, well, you know, that's the kind of things I was interested in. <laughs> yeah. If I would have known a little bit better, uh, I mean, I was only like, I was going it was in going into 10th grade yeah uh, I, I would have found the mixer somewhere yeah do you have any uh, i was going to ask if you have the front of house position i i highly doubt it. Either. Look. i've got some pictures from the crowd and i don't have it but i swear i remember looking out and seeing doc sitting there doc eskenazi uh and and i spent a lot of time right underneath this where you are basically now except on the ground or feet on the ground anyway and uh i preferred concerts where you could just get right up to the front yeah this was on a the sunday okay okay cool hey ask that guy right up on the uh, stage there he's got he's got some pictures yeah yeah, I don't recognize that guy, but there you go. And then is is somebody else presenting next week, next Saturday? I don't remember. I'm sorry to say. And the other the other possibility is that we just talk because yeah. we always seem to find things to chat I, about. I got a book, um, Ray Fouks, the one at the organizer of the Yellow White Festival. I'll get a link for it later. Uh, he's published two books, one on up to the Dylan concert and then the one for the last one. Hmm. Uh, I've got the first book. Hmm. It, it's actually quite interesting to read. And I'm surprised I was expecting it to be... Oh, uh, Bob Dylan! Um. Yeah, the book to be pretty crap, you know, pretty poor, really, but it's actually quite interesting and fairly balanced, I think, actually, as well. So it's not defensive at all. It's quite good. Good. Okay. You want to talk about that? Not really, no. Okay. <laughs> well, you just did. Enough. Okay, well, let's go to Luke. Okay, let me get my sharing here. All right, hopefully you can all see that. So I'm, uh, I'm calling this my evolution of putting on and recording house concerts, uh, but I'm subtitling it The Continuing Excuse for Luke to Buy More Gear. So, so uh, right here, this is um, something that uh, I started doing early on and have continued. Um, just a fun thing when, when people come, I uh, print, uh, make uh, badges. And so the artist gets a badge and I wear one and it's just a fun little thing. So there's 27 shows in this photo uh, from uh, June 2012 to uh, March of 2019. Uh, one show was missing, didn't get badges made that time, and have had uh, four more since that, uh, since the last one here. So 32 shows in all so far. And uh, we'd, we'd have more if not for COVID-19. So um, hopefully at some point we can start doing this again. But um, going back to 2011, uh, I'd been to one house concert before and it was not very familiar with them. Uh, so at any rate, the first person on the, on the list there is Carly Bear. And I had uh, first seen her in, in 2011. And uh, two of the first three shows I went to with her were house concerts. And I said to her, we kind of gotten to know each other. And I said, you know, would you be interested in playing my house? And she said, sure. So that's what started, uh, started all this. And just as a quick note, there's all different ways that, that people uh, do these. Um, 
I've done it where, uh, you know, invite friends and uh, they can invite friends or, you know, post it to the neighborhood groups or whatever. It's um, mostly friends and family, but the public is welcome. And, you know, sometimes we, we have gotten, you know, random uh, people show up, but uh, and I, we got a tip jar where we say, you know, oh, it's suggested $10 or suggested $20, you know, please put something in. But some people take money at the door. Sometimes there's uh, sites where uh, people actually set up tours where they just set up house concerts and uh, you buy tickets online and then when you show up they've got a list of all the, the uh, you know attendees and check people off so there's all different ways to do it um, but the, I wanted to get into this number one because of the music but then two uh, I like recording and I thought hey I can you know I've done some recording of shows but hey if I have house concerts I can you know record all the time so uh, again kind of always liked uh, recording and, and, and uh, audio things like that and uh, kind of back in the day I, I first I had one mini disc recorder then I had two uh, initially it was just you know recording from the board whatever that may be and then at some point I got uh, I bought a couple of mic elements from Radio Shack and soldered on some RCA uh, jacks and I could, you know, record the audience and, you know, put them together in post. And so that was kind of the, the next step. Eventually got these Tascam uh, solid state uh, recorders to replace the mini discs. And then uh, at one point a friend was moving and cleaning stuff out. She says, here, here's a box of, you know, all kinds of uh, gadgets and doodads. Um, I, I've got these microphones for recording shows and, uh, you know, you can have them if you want. And what a what they are are Audio-Technica uh, hanging choir microphones and there's a company that I believe still exists that takes microphones like this and puts them in little cases and uh, you know with clips and then they, they put on an eighth inch uh, jack on the end so you can plug into a mini disc or a recorder like this and you can you know put the mics on your hat or your glasses or something you know for uh, covert recording of uh, you know big shows or something but um, so I got those, and those were kind of the, the first real mics I had. So, and then I have not been a musician since uh, band in high school, so I thought, you know, I can't justify buying real microphones and stands and whatever. So this is what um, this is what I had initially. Uh, but then when I was going to do the first uh, show with Carly, I thought, well, I want to have some sort of, you know, real multi-track solution, and I, I use real in, in quotes, but um, I had this lying around, it's a USB interface, and I found some software that you can, uh, basically it combines interfaces, so if you've got, you know, this stereo interface, and you've got an interface, you know, built into your laptop, as, as this was, um, you can put them together, and it it's like a virtual, you know, four-channel interface. Then, so I thought, okay, I can use that. I can put, you know, vocal mic and a guitar mic into one, and you know, room mics in the other, and I've got four tracks, and I'll, I'll do that. So, I use that for the first few shows. Um, and so the first one again was uh, Carly. Um, for this, I was able to borrow a mic stand and a Shure SM58. And uh, for the guitar, I actually just. Um, put one of those Audio Technica mics on a little piece of wire here and just pointed it at the at the guitar and, and that was the the, high, the fancy setup and the two room mics are actually on the curtain rod up here uh, just kind of facing out and that's just uh, what I was doing that first time around so uh, this is uh, that first show uh, Carly Bear from June uh, 2012 I'm an old woman Named after my mother My old man was another A child grown old Dreams with thunder Lightning was desire This old house would have burned down A long time ago Make me an angel Just 
before I move on, two things. One, was that coming through all right for everybody? That was nice, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, also, the recordings I'm playing uh, aren't necessarily what I would consider the best recordings I've ever made. Um, it's more of just an example of the evolution of how things went. So there's certain things that I'd love to play, but you know, are, are kind of... Uh, uh, superfluous or uh, you know repeat other things but so this is just giving you an idea of how things progressed Great. Um, so uh, after that show um, this was something I'd, I'd had uh, a long time uh, hooked up to my computer um, into my sound card that I was using for you know, recording needle drops and things like that and uh, a friend let me borrow this uh, uh, EMU uh, 0404 interface, which it's a USB interface. There's two um, uh, mic inputs, and then you can have a, a digital input. So I thought, okay, well, I can use this, you know, plug two mics into this, and then I can uh, plug the uh, uh, that uh, DIO uh, into the digital input to get two more channels. So again, four channels, a little bit more. Uh, you know, I don't want to say professional, less less kludgy, we'll put it that way. Um, and around this time, I also uh, bought uh, SM58, SM57, and a couple mic stands. So this is a shot of my living room, uh, my now previous living room in uh, January 2013. Uh, you can see uh, kind of how things were laid out. You can see the, the room mics up here on the... Uh, the curtain rod up in the upper left corner. And then going back here on the right is the uh, the dining room. And later on, uh, I don't have direct photos of it, but I would move the room mics back to this uh, opening uh, into the dining room, just kind of above there. So. Uh, I think a, it would sound better from there, just, per, just it, personally. Yeah, well, so the, the, the primary reason they were in the, the front of the room to begin with is because I had my laptop and recording stuff there. And so it was, you know, not having to run cables back and, and, and whatnot. But uh, again, this was all just kind of, you know, uh, as I went along, okay, this seems like a good idea or let's try this and, uh, you know, not going by any sort of script or anything. And the room mics were unbalanced RCA connectors, right? So you don't want yeah. to run them all the way over creation. Yeah, and actually, the, this uh, <laughs> you mentioned that uh, from one of those early shows when I was setting up, I actually uh, I was listening and I'm like, oh, I'm getting a lot of you know hum, and I'm trying this and I'm trying that, and I finally figured out that I was using a, a 20 foot RCA to RCA stereo cable, and the cable I was using was a newer one, and I had a old cable that I'd had for 15, 20 years at that point, and it was twisted, it was it was mangled. I tried that one, it was fine. So I don't know if it was the something with the twists in the cable or what, but it was just one of those things that, well, I guess this works, so I'll, I'll use that. At any rate, this is just another shot of that setup. Um, uh, there's a porch, uh, the three-season porch in the front there, and actually, when I was just setting things up, I had the, the uh, table here, but then for the actual show, I'd actually put it out on the porch, feed the stuff through the window. So then um, did a couple shows that way, and then uh, so I um, was going to have a, a band come, and this the, the first couple shows were just uh, like you saw, just uh, unplugged acoustic, you know, no uh, amplification or anything. And um, had a what ended up being a five-piece band, and I wasn't even thinking about a PA at the time. But then um, the leader says, "Yeah, well, you know, I could, you know, need something to, you know, get above the noise of all our instruments." So, okay, so I'll come up with something, and just bought a couple cheap mic splitters so I could split the mics, uh, you know, for recording and for PA. And then this was my PA. Uh, got a pioneer amp, which I still have, and was just plugging the mics into the mic inputs in here, and that was as fancy as I was getting in, in uh, March of 2013. Uh, basically, I had one speaker connected uh, for 
uh, you know, fold back for the musicians, another for uh, you know the audience. And uh, this was that show. So it was uh, uh, two guitars, uh, violin. Uh, there's the electric cello, and then a cajon. And for this, I still just had the four mics. I had the two room mics, and the um, in this case, two vocal mics. And uh, I don't know. I thought surprisingly uh, for having that minimal of a setup, the recording ended up being, uh, I don't know, more impressive than I may, may have expected. So here's Mike Mangione in the Union. Hey, I'll never doubt you love me in the words that you sing. It don't mean a whole lot, baby. It means everything. And good So maybe not amazing, but um, I think I could have done a lot worse. No, I think that sounded great. Very and, nice. And I also used to know a, a Welsh engineer who referred to the brand that you were using as pie in ear. So every time I see it, I think of that. <laughs> <laughs> so Luke, so um, oh, yeah. that was um, that was much was much nicer until they got louder and the, and then I think Zoom started mangling it. Oh, that's too bad. But um, at the, the the intro was really nice and very spacious. Well, they, uh, that's definitely, in, it's, uh, you know, only playing a 30 second or minute clip, so can't get into it too much. But one thing these guys are really good at is, you know, starting out really quiet and then it's like this explosion at the end. So I, I tried to give you a little bit of that, but uh, hopefully zoom, um, I can turn the volume down just a hair. Maybe that'll help. Um, Katie asked if you know anything about that violin. Um, Basically. Is, not specifically. Is it anything um, other than uh, wood? Is it a non-wood violin? I um, I know it's black. Uh, uh, I, I I could ask her um, exactly. I I think it's wood, but I'm not sure. Um, I know it's uh, it is an acoustic violin. Obviously, there's, there's a pickup, and they were playing through amps, but um, it was not just like a, a you know electric violin where that didn't really project into the room. It could be painted. I think I was wondering if it was carbon fiber. Yeah, it, it could be. I'm not sure. Um, I can probably find, uh, well, I know I have better photos of it that I can, uh, maybe once I'm done, I can find and share. So, um, and, oh, and one other thing. So if anybody, as I'm going along, feel free to jump in and ask questions or, or make comments. The only thing is during the clips, um, just stay muted because there's had issues with that. But anyway. Did, did they bring that monitor? Or is that something uh, you put together? Uh, what What's the, you mean there's, like? There's the, a speaker pointing at them? Oh yeah, the, so the, those are just my uh, Pioneer uh, desktop uh, speakers that... Um, I, oh, I that's the monitor and the PA. Yeah, so the, the monitor yeah. is uh, face, the one, the one on the left yes. is, is facing them, and then th this was yes. all it was for the for the vocal PA, but yes. uh, it uh, worked out. So. Great. Um, the, so the next big step was um, I decided I was, you know, hosting more house concerts and I was also, you know, recording shows uh, at other venues and I thought, okay, I, I need to move into the, you know, quote unquote real world. So got a Tascam DR680, which was a big deal at the time. Uh, there's six mic inputs, um, four uh, combo XLR TRS, and then there's two more that are just TRS. And you can also record two additional tracks with a digital input. So I had that um, that uh, Art DIO uh, AD box, and so with that I could record up to eight tracks with this, which uh, again was was kind of a big deal. So was that a hard disk or a CD recorder? Uh, SD. Uh, oh, SD, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, SD media. 
so um, yeah, so the first so I, I'd, I'd use that to record a few shows um, elsewhere, uh, mainly you know board plus uh, room mics. But the uh, the first time I ever had a house concert uh, it was was this one, and as I was talking to Gary the other day, I the the um, the machine is very uh, it's useful you can do a lot of things with it but if you don't know what you're doing you don't necessarily get the best results and this has the option of each of the inputs can be switched from line or mic and then for uh, the mic you can switch between low and high gain and I must have read something that you know oh be careful with high gain because you'll overload or something like that so I had them switch to low gain which I've found that uh, with dynamic mics Unless you're in a really loud source, you, you probably want to have them on high gain. So I didn't yet know that. And uh, for this show, uh, it's not awful, but uh, there's definitely more noise than I would like. So this is uh, June 2013. Again, uh, Carly Bear is back. And this was the first house show with the test cam. She wanted to run away with the circus. She was so tired of paying her dues And the thought of leaving made her nervous But the thought of staying sure gave her the blues And she didn't take well to the news No, she didn't take well to the news Seven years on, it's not too bad, but at the time I was really frustrated with how it turned out. So, um, Sounded good to me. And then uh, around this time, uh, I found somebody on Taper Section who uh, sold me um, phantom power adapters uh, for the, those mics, basically how they would have come originally. So bought those, put on some uh, mini XLRs to connect and disconnect them uh, so I could you know, plug them into the task cam without having a battery box or something, which that had been a problem for one show where I was afraid I was going to drain the battery, so I had unplugged it before the show and I forgot to plug it in, you know, at the start of the recording. So obviously no no issues with, with these, with Phantom Power. But I did uh, actually keep the eighth inch plug and, you know, I can use that with uh, plug-in power with the you know, recorder if I ever want to. I usually don't, but it's something I have around. So the next step was uh, I was visiting with a friend and he had this Mackie in his basement and I was kind of eyeing it and he said you want to borrow it? And I said sure and at the time I didn't know what I was going to do with it other than just look at it but uh, not long after that I set up another uh, concert with uh, Mike Mangione and the Union that, that band we saw before and okay, well, I can use that for the, the PA and uh, ended up, um, you can see there, I've got a um, like a 5.1 home theater uh, receiver there, which I just, I used uh, two channels for the um, fold back and then, you know, two channels for uh, the, uh, you know, the PA for the room. And what I ended up doing is I, I had eight tracks available on the task cam, and so two of those were uh, for the room or the audience mics, which I had plugged into the Mackie and then just used the inserts there to, to go into the uh, DIO. And then there were four vocal mics, all uh, mixed down to uh, one of the um, sub buses on the Mackie, and that fed another track. Uh, initially, I was going to have mics on the uh, the two guitar amps, the the uh, cello amp and the violin amp, and those were going to go to four more tracks, and then the um, bass and cajon were going to be submixed on the Mackie and, and go into the last track on the Tascam. But as we were setting up, the um, violinist was having problems with her amp, so we ended up she ended up just plugging into the cello amp, and uh, ended up using separate tracks for the uh, bass and cajon and uh, one thing I'll add is at this point I still only had I think maybe two or three mics um, the Shures 
and uh, they uh, thankfully brought a bunch both for their vocals and so I could mic up the amps. I'd bought a bunch of mic stands though, so I had that covered and had the had the cables and stands, but not all of the uh, the mics. But this was kind of a big deal at the time. It, it was like a you know quote uh, real multi-track recording eight track uh, seemed like a big deal. So this is again Mike Mangione in the Union from September of 2013. So that um, turned out pretty well, and I thought I was, you know, kind of finally maybe getting the hang of things. Uh, Your mains and monitors grew also. Oh yeah, so I, uh, so the the um, the monitors were those two uh, Pioneer uh, desktop speakers, and then I think during that time I'd gotten two uh, a pair of uh, Pioneer uh, tower speakers. So that's what those are. Cool. And that's that basic setup has continued to serve me through uh, 2020 um, for shows in my house anyway. And your lighting got more sophisticated too. Well, that's uh, I I've added the uh, the um, Christmas lights here, but otherwise the, the mic usually brings lights, so that's the dramatic lighting in that photo is from Mike. So unfortunately, this is the aftermath of. Uh, Having uh, you know a dozen or more uh, mic cables going across your your living room floor, and it's a problem that I wouldn't address uh, for several more years, just because every time I'd go to uh, look at buying a, a snake, I kind of got sticker shock, but uh, finally got over it, as we'll see later. And then uh, over the next uh, I don't know year or so, I was just kind of acquiring more and more microphones. Uh, got some Audio Technica and Rode mics here. This was uh, kind of what I had in probably early 2014, I think. Later on, got a, another um, Audio Technica. This is multi pattern. And that was the setup I used for this show. And so this is a uh, view from the dining room, and you can see where I'm running the cables up and over here for the, the room mics. And um, here you can see uh, got the two larger Audio, Te Audio Technica mics for the vocals, and then uh, this is one of the Audio Technica uh, pencil mics for the guitar, and this is one of the Rode pencil mics. But this was um, October of 2014, and it's uh, Albatross and Chris Simmons. <laughs> What do you see? I can't tell the wood from the trees. It's been a long, hard road for me. I'm confused about where I should be. Confused about where I should be. Well, tell me, is there something that I can't see? Silver light and hiding from me. The interesting note, uh, these guys are actually both from England. Uh, the guy on the left, Chris Simmons, he lives there now. The guy on the right, uh, Adam, he lives in Nashville now, but is uh, from England. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then the next step was uh, 
hey, more tracks, always need more tracks. So got a, uh, I had a show coming up with another band and wanted more than the eight tracks I could deal with. So got a Tascam 680 uh, Mark II, which is pretty much the same as the, as the Mark I. There's just some kind of functionality improvements and things, but um, you, you look at the outside and they're almost identical. This one's got the red, uh, red little bump outs there, but otherwise very similar. But the key is, is that you can take the digital out from one and what you would do is have like a, a sub mix of what you're recording, a monitor mix basically, pick the digital out from that and put it to the digital in of a second machine. And then uh, they stay in sync and you can uh, line them up in post and have up to 14 tracks if you uh, use an AD on the first machine and then you know link it to the second machine and, and do everything so it's it's a little kludgy but um again between two oh go ahead Janie. so they just daisy chain together right yep and the these actually there's a function where if you hit record on one it'll automatically uh put the put the uh, secondary one and record uh the only issue is it's not um they stay in sync once they start but they don't start in sync so if you hit record on one, the, the other one might come on 100 samples later or 200 samples later or 400 samples later or I don't, whatever it is. So um, so is it to, best to just start them both manually at once? Well, no, I mean, you're going to, it's you know impossible to get, you know, get them perfect. So it's, mm. um, it's not a big deal. It's just that what, what you do then is on the, the downstream recorder, you record what's coming from the upstream one which is you know kind of a reference mix and then you just compare that reference mix on the downstream recorder with your individual tracks on the upstream recorder uh when you um, go to mix and then you just line them up so yeah it's not okay. a huge it's not a huge it's not a huge deal it's just a you know another step that's a bit of a pain so so in mixing you um you still keep the individuality of all the tracks yep so what you end up with is um, between uh, six and eight, up to six, six, up to six or eight tracks on the upstream machine. And then the, on the downstream machine, you have between uh, four and six tracks um, from that machine. And then you're recording a mix of the upstream machine. So then you can uh, line up that mix with the yeah. individual, individual tracks from the upstream That's machine. That's like for sync. Yep. So yeah, so they they stay in sync uh, over the duration of recording. It's just that they don't start at exactly the same time. Right. So you just have to have something to line up on. Yeah, and so you know, usually what I'll do is uh, if the if the upstream one, you know, has a well, regardless of what it is, you know, you look for a clap or a you know some sort of transient where there's you, know, you can right. definitely see in the waveform, and then you just you know line up from there. Or the drummer handily counting it off. Yep, so, something like that. Yeah. So, um, so that was used uh, for this next show, and by this time, I'd uh, I'd given my friend his Mackie back, and I bought one uh, for myself off eBay. Uh, this was the slightly larger one. His had eight mic inputs. Mine had uh, twelve. They call it a sixteen, but the the last four uh, channels are just uh, stereo channels. They don't have uh, mic inputs. But at any rate. Um, had uh, you know, things running into the Mackie uh, for the PA, but then also uh, things running out to the, those two recorders uh, in sync there. And you can see I was uh, just taking the inserts uh, off the Mackie, you know, like for the vocal mics and things to run into the recorders. So I didn't have everything set up yet at this point, but you can get the idea of, of what I was doing then. And this was the band. Um, there was a, a percussion on the left there, bass, um, just a vocal and then uh, well, th four vocal mics and then uh, violin, which was just through her vocal mic, uh, mandolin, which was uh, through a DI. And then the guitar and the piano were both coming through the same DI. So he would switch off and they would, they would come through. So this is, uh, this is from July of 2015 and this is the getaway drivers. Still tear what it used to be. So much 
much better when you loving me. Yeah, yeah. And I love you when you're not around. Black dog days are bearing down. Baby, I think I miss you. I miss you, kitty. Unrelated to the recording, but I thought for having one snare, one cymbal, and some miscellaneous percussion, uh, he did a pretty good job of uh, filling in for a you know whole drum kit or something. So um, well, I could have listened to all of that one. Well, I can. Uh, oh, it's good. Uh, whoever's in, yeah, who's ever interested, hit me up afterwards, and I can uh, I can send you some links. Cool. So. Uh, unfortunately, I've got uh, YouTube videos for a lot of things, but uh, what I end up taking video of uh, is often kind of random. So, like, you know, I would have taken a video for that song, but uh, I didn't. So uh, this was the next kind of random or one of the next kind of random acquisitions on eBay. It's a uh, gold-plated uh, Shure uh, 545, and it's uh, some sort of custom build, I think. They, they did make... Uh, sure did make gold-plated mics for sale, but not with this exact configuration. And I talked to the Sure historian about it, and he wasn't sure, but it must have been some sort of uh, uh, custom thing. But at any rate, I usually use this for um, for lead vocals, like whoever was kind of the front person, and still do. This is kind of my uh, you know lead vocalist mic. Is that a combination shock mount and uh, quick release? Uh, it's not a quick release. You can mm -hmm. there, there. You could get a quick release for it, but this is actually just screwed on to the stand. Um, but so this was the sh sure use this same mount for the 546, uh, the 566, uh, SM56. There are many different mics. They use this same uh, thing. There's a switch here mm -hmm. where you can uh, turn it on and off. Basically, it's high impedance, low impedance. Or high impedance off, low impedance is a little switch, and sometimes they have covers that you know you can just set it, set it, and then cover it up so people can't uh, fiddle with it. Good. So um, this was actually the last show ever in my house in Madison. Uh, in the over the the year that had passed since the last show, I'd. Uh, gotten engaged and uh, started living in Milwaukee and uh, was getting this house ready for sale and it, uh, right before this uh, got an offer and would be selling it uh, shortly so decided to have one last uh, one last uh, party here and uh, it was also the first time ever had a uh, full drum kit uh, in the house so these guys are just a four piece um, but it was kind of exciting having a, a full ba a band with a full drum kit. So this is from July 2016. This is Royal Jelly. By this time, I had two of the um, AT 2050s, um, which I used for the drums. There's one overhead here, and then one you can't see, but uh, it's on the side, so it's a, a Glyn Johns type setup. And then Mike's on the the kick and the snare. Um, and then it was a double header that night, and so uh, Carly played the first and last uh, shows at. My house there, and uh, by this time, this was, I've, you know, mostly been showing you uh, amplified things, but most of the shows I I put on there were uh, acoustic like this, um, you know, no PA. So, just had the uh, the AT pencil mic uh, for the guitar and the 2050 for the vocal, and uh, here it was in uh, figure of eight. 
So the, the null is kind of pointed at the guitar for a little bit more separation. But um, again, this is Carly Bear from July 2016. It called me in a dream. It pulled me right out of bed. I couldn't shake the melody that was ringing in my head. So I packed a bag and I locked the door and I headed for the track. And God and the devil knows I ain't look back. So that ended the first chapter of Casa de Luke Pack, <laughs> but, but uh, then moved to Milwaukee. Before you and, move, can uh, I ask a question? What's the Daniel for, ate the sandwich? Uh, that's sign another that's been uh, so prominently. So that's uh, another artist, um, which I actually, uh, after the presentation, I could I could play a clip of uh, something I recorded with, with her, but uh, she's a. Um, Guitarist, uh, ukuleleist, um, and uh, actually, the first time I saw her was where I met Carly. Uh, Carly opened for her, and uh, her real name is Danielle Anderson, but her her stage name is Danielle Ate the Sandwich, and um, she's a you know uh, by by this point I think in her early thirties, and uh, she kind of got big on YouTube uh, back in the. About 2010, I think she was featured on the YouTube uh, homepage and got, you know, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of views or something. And so that's kind of what uh, kickstarted her career. But um, saw her a number of times, had her at the house a couple times. And um, at this house, it was a little, little bit more informal. I had some, you know, posters up and stuff in the living room. So that was one cool. of those. Thank you. But I can, uh, afterward, after I get through all this, I'll. I'll play just a brief clip of uh, one of hers. So this is the uh, the house in Milwaukee, which is where I am now. I'm up, up, one level up from this uh, as I'm speaking. But um, again, had a, this is taken, the photo's taken um, kind of between the uh, living room and dining room. The dining room's behind me, uh, behind the camera and uh, living room and then there's a parlor in the front which will will come into play uh, uh, later but you can see it set the speakers up on either side there and then um, usually the artists would if there was you know one or two they kind of stand in this opening and that that worked out pretty well and uh, one change was it's a little bit bigger space and i think crowds were a little louder so just about everything I've had here has been uh, amplified. We haven't. We did one set, uh, one show uh, unplugged, but otherwise everything's been through a PA. So, and this was a, a typical setup. Uh, again, got the Mackie mixer, uh, the two Tascam recorders, got various uh, inserts uh, going into the Tascams, and then um, going forward. Uh, this is looking from the front of the house from that parlor and you can see into the dining room there's this like lattice work or something and it's the perfect place to mount the the room mics so I've got those two uh, audio technica choir mics just uh, mounted up there for the room uh, so that that works out well and if I see people are chatting in the chat room but I'm not gonna go in there but if somebody wants to if, if there's a question or something please relay it or, or whatever um, that's a comment question oh, yeah. more comment I was just thinking that'll be interesting acoustically just due to the way the rooms will couple through the doorway yeah well we'll uh, get there in just about a second so um, so this setup was for um, we'll see in the next in the next um, photo for uh, two guitarists and a bass player and um, I've got a DI set up for the PA for the guitars, but then also uh, got the audio, te audio technica mics set up for recording uh, for the guitars. And uh, here they are. This is Jared Rabin, and he brought a couple friends along. And I can't continue without pointing out that uh, the girl on the right here, who was uh, kind of backing vocals and guitar, her name's Ren Patrick. 
and she was actually on this season of American Idol. So uh, she didn't make it too far, but it was a big deal, and it was kind of cool that, hey, we actually had somebody who's been on American Idol. So this is, uh, we're up to July of 2018 now, and this is Jared Rabin. Haunt the streets all through the summer, kicking up the dust that hides our past. The Cumberland on as the whistle starts blowing. There's nothing I can do to make it last. Take my hand, drive me crazy, because we don't have too long. One little uh, thing I'll point out here is on the table on the right, uh, that's the tip jar, which always uh, have some funny graphics on there for uh, other tips, like the tip of the iceberg and fingertip and things, but uh, just a picture of the artist and uh, say, okay, everybody, put your money in there. Did so, you have monitors for this one? Yep. Um, oh. You can uh, oh, yeah. okay. see, them, see them there. Yep. Because I felt like I was hearing those in the other one, but I didn't feel like I was hearing them on this one. Hmm. Yeah, and I, one point to make is uh, all of these mixes I've been playing, you know, they're all mixed from, uh, you know, some sort of multi-track, and they've all been mixed, you know, shortly after the, uh, whenever I made the recording. So you're not only witnessing the evolution of the house concerts and recording, but the evolution of... Uh, Luke's mixing abilities or, uh, you know, how things get mixed. So uh, if I went back and remixed some of these things, they might sound different or I might say, oh, you know, I, I've got too much room in uh, room mics here. I should cut those back or maybe the opposite. But uh, so that's, you know, if you heard the raw tracks for all these, obviously they would sound different from the final mixes. So this was a kind of a huge step forward. Uh, the spring of last year, I was kind of mulling over what to do. I, I felt like I needed more tracks. Didn't know if I should get a third uh, DR680 or uh, c computer interface or what. And uh, this had come out not long before. It's the Tascam Model 24. And what it is, it's a combination um, analog mixer similar to the Mackie but it has an integrated uh, digital multi-track recorder that records on SD cards. And it also has USB out, so you can use it as an interface with uh, you know, whatever uh, computer software you have. So um, I've you know, primarily been using it for live sound and uh, using the internal recorder, but um, I have played a little bit with uh, hooking up to a computer. And so, like I say, this was, uh, this was quite a big deal. I didn't have to hook up you know, two separate recorders. I didn't have to patch things together. You just plug them into the board and uh, hit record and you can go. And uh, we're again jumping ahead. This is actually um, from last November uh, from 2019. And this is a view from uh, the stairs. And so on the left here, you can see the living room and on the right is the parlor in front. And uh, this was, uh, Mike Mangione was coming back, and he was uh, bringing the, the full band, including uh, the full drum kit. So what ended up doing was setting up Mike and his brother uh, in the living room here on the left, and then kind of setting up for the rest of the band in the back here uh, in the, in the uh, parlor, the drums and uh, everything else. And this is just a shot of, you can see uh, ahead of time I had, you know, Mike stands out, and. I should add, you know, I kind of glossed over a lot of things, but I'd been slowly uh, accumulating mics uh, over the years, so uh, I wasn't going to show you every single one I got, but here we've got a bunch of uh, Shure uh, 57s and uh, 56s and a couple of uh, EV uh, 655Cs, and uh, I've got the uh, AT 2050s here for the drums. And this was just showing the uh, the setup for that show. Didn't have everything quite laid out yet. Uh, 
mainly because uh, Mike's had some changes in his band over the years, and um, so the, most of the people that were in the, the previous shows uh, weren't in his band anymore, but uh, he'd had new uh, violin and cello players, but recently they've they'd gotten so busy they said, well, we can't play with you anymore, you know, we just we don't have time. Um, but when I booked this show, it was going to be a four-piece with Mike, and he had new string players. Uh, they had asked, hey, can we come and open? And I said, well, it's fine with me, but let me check with Mike, because I don't know if there's, you know, I don't know what the situation is, how he would feel, but he said, okay, that's fine. And he said, well, um, I'm not going to bring my, my string players, I'll bring the bass and drums. I said, okay, that's fine. So I didn't know if it would be the four of them or all six of them would be playing together, but um, so the show opened with uh, the, the, the uh, violin and cello, the assisted strings is what they go by. But at set break, I did not know what was happening for the second set um, and found out very quickly that oh, they all six would be playing together. So that was pretty cool. Uh, one thing to note is on the, uh, the Model 24 here, there's 12 uh, channels that are mono channels with mic inputs and then four channels there, stereo channels with mic inputs, and so you can either use those as a, uh, you know, essentially mono mic input, or if you have line level signals, you can uh, use that for stereo. So if you've got a, a stereo keyboard, or uh, in this case, I've got uh, the room mics um, plugged into a little uh, Behringer mixer back here and just um, insert into their, uh, into one channel of the uh, one stereo channel of the model 24 so I didn't have to take up um, two mic inputs on there and another uh, big thing callback to earlier is finally got a snake uh, I decided having a dozen or more cables across the living room floor was not ideal and uh, finally just was able to you know put this in the parlor and, and run shorter cables uh, I couldn't tell you how much of a pain this was to get. Um, I'd ordered one from some retailer and it was it seemed like a good deal, but was not coming, was not coming, was not coming, and it was getting to the point where I needed this and finally canceled that, um, put in an order with Full Compass, which is in Madison, and that was going to be fine, except that was delayed and that was delayed and that was delayed, and finally it, it came in the day before uh, the, the concert, so I actually had to drive over and pick it up. Uh, they were going to ship it, but I said, no, I just, I, I got to get it in person. So got this the day before the show. And uh, here's a view from the living room. Um, Mike was switching off between uh, acoustic and he's got a Strat there. Uh, his brother's on a Strat. And then um, the rest of the band is in the, the parlor there. And you can see on the right, uh, people standing in the in the hallway and on the stairs one thing i didn't address is typically for shows in milwaukee we'll have somewhere between maybe 25 and 40 people come um it's it's always a crap shoot it's one of the hardest things is to figure out how many people are actually going to be there um but this show uh between mike and his band and sister strings opening uh, we had huge turnout. I think between us and the band and the audience, we had about 70 people turn out. So I don't know if we had 70 people all in all in there at one point. I know some people came and went, but we did have quite a few people. And then uh, this is a shot of the rest of the band back in the in the, the, the front parlor. So this is uh, Mike Mangione and the Kin in uh, November 2019 and some of you have heard this before I, these were the clips I used to test zoom From the moment to eternity Ooh, yeah. Ooh. 
So that was a big excitement, um, having them all there. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier is, so I didn't know that all six of them would be playing together, and when they said, oh, yeah, Shanti and Monique are going to be uh, playing with us, I didn't know where to put them. I hadn't had, you know, mics set up in a specific spot for them, and so they just kind of ended up on the couch, and uh, Shanti stood up and Monique sat on the couch, and we kind of fit things in, but it was a, it was a tight fit. So if, if uh, we do this again sometime, I'll probably move one of these couches out here or something to kind of give a bit more room. But um, so that was uh, November 2019. The last show we've had was uh, so far is, uh, February 2020. And uh, this is uh, Lily Detay. She's from Iowa. She uh, just graduated college, and we saw her actually opening for uh, Jared, who we uh, saw a few uh, few songs ago, and she just knocked us out. She uh, plays guitar, sings, uh, plays piano, and plays harmonica. And this was the second time we had her. Uh, spin the bottle so you know three people pair off and uh, go write a song and uh, you know, they do that every day and so by the end of the week they've you know each written three or four songs in this fashion and then plus people also just pair off and you know randomly write other songs and then at the end of the week they put on concerts for all these uh, new songs they've played so what's one thing I haven't mentioned is you know how do I know all these people or you know how do I get them in a, you know to come to the house and it's really a matter of uh, you go see somebody and you, you know, You know, it, it's kind of a snowball where you, you see one person, then become friends with them, and then they know somebody, and then they bring them or tell them or you know something. And so, I've kind of uh, got all these people that I'm now friends with, and you know who've come and played and things. So, um, again, this is the last uh, show we've had uh, so far, and this is Lil Lily Detay with a uh, Black Keys cover. Oh, can it be voices calling me? They get lost and all the time. Should have seen it glow. Everybody knows how to broken heart is blind. How to broken. And then for, for this show, that was just her solo. But um, like I say, we also had two other people that were uh, both played solo and played with her a bit. And then another friend uh, played harmonica um, on a few songs too. So had a, had a kind of a fun time there. And then uh, with COVID, uh, we were supposed to have another show in April that got canceled. But you know, musicians have been doing uh, you know, webcasting, uh, live streaming, and thought that'd be cool to do. So finally, after they, they came back in stock, I got a Logitech Brio, which is actually what I'm streaming on right now, and uh, got this little tripod thing that actually fits on that, that uh, separation between the living room and dining room. So uh, I've been playing around with OBS, which is a uh, streaming program. And this is uh, a view there. So um, if we ever uh, you know, have shows again in the future, uh, hopefully we'll be uh, live stream live streaming them too like on youtube or something so haven't gotten that far yet but maybe at some point in the future so that's it for the presentation hey that's great yeah, cool bravo. thank bravo. you Luke. 
Well done. You sure, you sure made some good friends. Yeah. yeah. Very talented. Yeah. There's so much talent in the world. We just don't, all we hear is what's on TV and what the radio feeds us. And your and your recording sounded great, very clean. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It, I you... heard it got a little bit better as time went on, maybe. Oh maybe. yeah, well that's why you upgrade, right? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. It was it was a combination of you know getting better equipment and also you know knowing what the heck I was doing and uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Li literally everything was just okay. I'm figuring it out and. Um, but uh, one quick thing, I know, I think Dan had asked about Danielle ate the sandwich, so I'll, I'll just play um, maybe about a minute or so of one of the recordings I made of before, her. I, before oh, you do that, sure. could you address your thoughts about reverb, adding reverb? That last one was the first one that I heard specific reverb added. Yeah, I'm so, curious. yeah, so, um, Obviously, the uh, all the early stuff was just acoustic. There was no PA, and that was just strictly the sound of you know, vocal mic, guitar mic, and room mics, and you know, just adjusting those in in uh, mixing. Um, when I st when I first started using the Mackie for the PA, I used some reverb uh, live in the room, and obviously the room mics would pick some of that up. But I wasn't adding any more in mixing, and um, I think what kind of finally changed it is uh, it was always a bit of a pain if I wanted it, I don't have any other like you know rack reverb unit or anything like that so I'd have to take the Mackie and patch that into my computer because I was mixing in Pro Tools and uh, I just never really bothered with it um, but then once I got the Model 24 that was you know the, the live mixer and now I've got the Mackie uh, sitting behind me here and I just have that kind of permanently patched in my computer, so I can use that to add reverb if I want. So the more the, the more recent shows, I've been uh, adding a bit more of that and mixing too. Okay, thanks. So uh, I'll just play maybe about a minute or so. This is uh, Danielle ate the sandwich from um, uh, October of 2013, and so this would have been. Um, two SM57s and the two room mics uh, into the task cam, so just four tracks. Ba -da -dum, ba -da 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 -dum. idea there yeah nice. nice blend and and I like the way that you um, separated that yeah that uh, that was I think finally that that was the the first acoustic show I you know finally figured out uh, it felt like I'd figured out okay I, I've got a, a system down here and it's it's working pretty well so I think you are the official zoom playback world champion <laughs> It really does sound good. I got the yeah. video monitors down here. I find myself cranking them up a lot of times there. Well, I'll, if, I'd be happy to help anybody that, that wants it. Like I say, it's, it's a combination of, I think, I really think Zoom has a bug with the, the desktop audio sharing. I don't, it yeah. doesn't seem like that's how it should work. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there was lots of pulling my hair out yesterday just kind of setting up a meeting with myself to see, okay, what does this actually sound like and uh, whatever, so. I hope your trouble ticket works. Well, we'll, we'll see. I'm not holding my breath, but maybe, <laughs> and, what, a, and a what we heard today. In Go his, ahead. I hear a very low frequency. That's his oh, air conditioner. Here, I'll, 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 I'll turn it off. Oh better? yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a ground problem, but it's not. No, but it's it's uh no, it's real sound. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. 
So Who Gordon, uh, or sorry, so uh, Luke, what we heard was your treatment of the Zoom per your email yesterday, is that correct? Yeah, so for anybody interested, um, normally, or at least when I've done this in the past, and I think when most of us have done it, when you share the screen, you can also say share your computer audio. And then mm -hmm. so you just, you know, when you play something <laughs> back, Zoom just picks up on it. But uh, for those not that didn't follow the big thread, I found out that Zoom is a really crazy, like 12 decibel cut above 8 kilohertz that just clobbers the high end. And initially, I, I just assumed it affected everything, but I eventually found out it only affects when you share desktop audio. Um, if you normally, you know, you've got your microphone plugged in or your interface, whatever comes in through there is not affected by that. So what I found is it's called voice meter banana. And uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, I don't ask me where the name came from, but uh, it's a, a virtual mixer. And so you can say, um, you know, in Windows, you can say my default, instead of my speakers being my default, uh, voice meter is the default device. And so anything you play back goes into voice meter. Uh, and then in voice meter, you can say, uh, you know, take my microphone input. And then um, you can also have multiple outputs. So like I've got one output going to Zoom that has my microphone and the desktop sound. And then you know, another output for the speakers, which I route Zoom into another virtual input so that I'm not back sound from Zoom back into Zoom. Oh, yeah. You guys will yeah. be yelling at me <laughs> if I did. So it was, it was a little, it, I, I think it's a little kludgy, but um, it seems to work pretty well. And, you know, as I've been going through, I can mute my mic when I'm you know, playing things back and stuff. But the point is everything in Zoom just goes through the main audio interface. It doesn't go through the, the, the share your computer sound. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Cool. Would you but do you still that? say share your computer audio? Well, no. Um, it, yeah, it's, oh, okay. the option is still there, but I just don't use it here. I will. Um, I can just share. You want my to do screen. that next week? Because we're getting. Yeah, well, that's a good well, idea. Here, 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 you can just see what it looks like. Um, yeah. So on the left here is the the mic uh, coming in, and then these are the the two virtual inputs. This is the one um, for basically most of the sound from my computer so i was playing music back and then this one is specifically from zoom and then you've got outputs this one is the the main output like to my speakers and then this is a, a virtual output to zoom so uh it's and then you can see it's just there's buses, uh, a one two three b is there, is there a routing page um there's more to it i've not uh gone into it too much but like here you can see you okay. can select you know, okay, my microphone, I'm only routing to B1, which is the, the virtual output to Zoom. But like the uh, computer sound, I'm routing both to A1, which is kind of, you know, my speakers, mm -hmm. and B1, which is the, the Zoom virtual output. And then the Zoom, the input from Zoom is only being routed to my speakers. I, I don't have B1 checked because mm -hmm. that would be a, a loop back. The feedback, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. So, so the routing the so you found that just that a different routing got rid of the eight uh, the high the eight kilohertz and above drop. Yeah, well, and so the the issue is is that anything you put into Zoom, so like if you if you click on the you know the menu and it says select a microphone, well, at least on Windows that just gives you a list of all of the interfaces on your computer, and so you can use any of those. It doesn't have to be a microphone. Mm -hmm. And um, you could use anything you select there is going to have like FM quality uh, sound. The tricky thing was is uh, managing, you know, playing back music with having a microphone. And I could have done it with an external mixer, but then, you know, there would have been issues with, well, could I hear what I was playing back? Uh, you know, the routing would start to get you know, a bit convoluted with, well, where am I plugging my headphones into and what am I listening to? And um, so this voice meter does the same thing. It's just that it's virtual instead of having a, a physical mixer plugged in. Voice oh. meter banana. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's great. And it, it, was, it was really confusing, too, because the people, there was a recommendation for there's just a voice meter without the banana, and it's basically the same thing, but there, it doesn't have as many buses. 
And I started to try and use that. And I, number one, was not understanding it. And then number two, realized that there's not enough here to do what I want. And then found the banana and <laughs> that that works how I need it to work. So. Is that what fee? Yeah, it's they, they say it's a donation where, um, as far as I know, it doesn't stop working at any point. It's been working since cool. yesterday. So. <laughs> and you said it's both Windows and Mac. Uh, as far as I know, it's, it's just Windows, but I oh. did see another app called um, Loopback, which it has a completely different interface, but I believe you can do similar things with it in terms of virtually patching interfaces on your computer. I, okay. I've used Loopback on my Mac, and it works great. So I can attest to that. Cool. Okay. Fantastic. I'm gonna get going, Dan. Yeah, me too. I'm gonna I'll scan your picture. I'll scan the rest of those pictures for you. Thank uh, you. The next day or two, and so you'll have probably not as exciting as this. But hey, I took a lot of pictures. Mainly Great. Girls, but, you know. Great. Okay. Boom. Well, wait, wait, wait. And I'll count wait. on you talking huh? too. Okay. I'll count on you talking to describe them. Oh, I'll I'll be there. Square, Good. Right? I, All right. I, I was going to say, okay. I was going to say, I can uh, post a Dropbox folder with the uh, the clips I played. If anybody wants to, you know, listen, not through Zoom, and then if you have any interest in any of uh, you know any of the artists or anything, just let me know and we can talk. Sure. Thanks, Luke. Thank Thanks. You. That's great. Nice job. Anyway, have a good night. Kate. Yeah. You too. Take it easy, Bob. See you. See ya. All right. I see Gordon nodding off. Oh, I'm that's okay. <laughs> Wait a week, just about. <laughs> <laughs> We've got quite a big uh, house group, house music or house concert scene over here now. It's become quite a quite a thing in Scotland and UK in general, actually. Even some quite big name people, you know, people you have heard of on radio, etc., do them as well now. You know, it's quite, cool. it's quite a thing, you know. Has it come back happening? It's not yet. No, yeah. no, it won't happen just now. It, all the people yeah. that were doing it are now doing live streams. I mean, yeah. My, yeah. my Facebook page is full of everybody I know as an acoustic musician. Yeah, I don't think live concerts should be happening for at least th until we get a vaccine. Yeah, it's going to be a while. Yeah. I was just going to say what, one one thing I was going to, uh, I hadn't thought of before, but now that we were talking and thought of it. Uh, so, Pretty much for all the concerts I've had, um, it's just been you know, we've had a, a tip jar or suge you know, suggested donation, and whatever goes in there goes to the artist or the band. Um, there's been a few times where you know, well, we'll often put in more than the you know, if it's twenty dollars, maybe we'll put in sixty or a hundred or something like that to kind of get things going. But um, a couple of years ago, uh, my wife is a big Tori Amos fan. And mm. we went to see her, and the band opening for her. Uh, this was a, a you know two thousand seat theater, and they said, "Wow, this is a great place, and you know we we love this." But you know normally we play living rooms, we play house concerts, mm. cool. and we thought, "Well, that's cool." So uh, during the break, uh, I went out to the merch table, and the guy was there hawking CDs, and I said, "You know, hey, just you know you play house concerts, you know, we host house concerts. Would you be interested?" And uh, oh yeah, yeah, you know, shoot me an email or, or whatever. And so they got back to me, and um, I can't remember who I talked to first. If it was the band or what, but then uh, their manager got in touch with me and said, "Okay, well, like, do you want to do a sixty-minute show or a ninety-minute show?" And I said, "You know, I don't know. You know, we just, uh, you know." Usually we'll do like two sets of 45 minutes to an hour, but you know we're flexible. You know whatever works. And he says, "Okay, well, well, here's here's the rate sheet." Yes. And for a 60 <laughs> 60 minute, uh, I think it was unamplified show. It was going to be twenty five hundred dollars. <laughs> for a 60 minute, it was a 60 minute show with PA it was going to be three thousand dollars. And for a 90-minute show with PA, it was going to be $3,500. And I said, uh, whoa, you know, sorry, but that, you know, there's really no way we can we can justify that. You know, if we're getting, uh, you know, even if you get 100 people at, uh, you know, 20 bucks a pop, that's still not even covering it. And, you know, we've uh -uh. never gotten 100 people. And, 
you know, we're certainly not going to have people pay a hundred dollars each, and we're not going to, you know, yeah, you know, put two thousand dollars out of our pockets. So no, went no. went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and finally, like, okay, we'll do it for still a lot, but much less. Mm. And then it was going to be okay. Well, we can do it on a Tuesday night. And I said, no, we can't do a, a Tuesday night, you know. And and that's the thing too is, um, I for anybody interested in doing this, I found that unless it's a Friday or Saturday night, it's really hard to get. Yeah, to go. people aren't going to come. Even yeah. even Sunday afternoons, you think, oh, you know, it's uh, people you've got time before you know work and stuff. Uh-uh. It, uh-uh. It's really hard. Um, I think the 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 Dan- Danielle the sandwich show I played a clip of. I think we had about ten people there. Uh, it was a, it was a Sunday night. It was a great show, uh, but uh, it was just you know it's kind of disappointing from a you know you want to support the artists and have people you know show up for them. So that was a little bit hard. Like oh wow, we had ten people show up to the show. Yeah, that's Bill Gates's living room that they're talking about. I think. <laughs> yeah, n- needless to say, we've not had that band that opened for Tori Amos. Yeah, I could see yeah. that. <laughs> well, it's a good gig. You can get I had a guitarist come up and, and he very, very rarely plays in Scotland, but we'd been doing some stuff with, uh, with, with one of his friends and he was wanting to come up to Scotland just as a holiday. So we, we had him in our house for uh, for a one night gig and put him up for the night while he was traveling and he could travel on up into the north of Scotland and that worked out quite well. But I think to have gotten him to do a, a small event with, you know, we can seat about 60 to 70 people in the front room and he... Hmm. Um, he uh, it would probably cost us about two grand to get him to do a gig, you know, mm-hmm. because we were helping him. He he was all right about it. I think we managed to get him four or five hundred pound as it turned out anyway, you know. But cool, yeah, it was quite a, a, that was a good gig. That's one of the few house concerts I've ever actually put on, but it was good fun. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so I think for that last Mike show where we had like seventy people, I think we brought in about nine hundred bucks. Well, that's cool. Great, yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, Tommaso, you've barely spoken up. Hello. Hello. Hello there. How are you? I'm good. Um, in Brooklyn, everything is uh, pretty much the same, just uh, staying alive. That's good. That's yep. all we can hope for these days. How does Tommaso get that spinning circle in his <laughs> where his picture should be? So That's a, an app. It's no, it's on the webcam on my Mac is there's like a bug or something, and um, it used to work, it just doesn't work anymore. And it's it's trying to um connect to it, but for whatever reason, it doesn't. It's and, trying uh, to connect to something that it can't connect to, yeah. I'm so. not sure why, but um, yeah, that's that's why that's it's hypnotic. Happening. <laughs> Should have been around for David's talk. <laughs> yeah, really, you should have seen that. It was uh. You talked about how to get your camera in the uh, an external camera into your gizmo, into your computer. Right. Yeah. Oh, I should I should try that. I should work on it. Apparently, the devices are difficult to order yeah. now. Go ahead, Gary. You were going to say something. No. Oh, I thought that was you. Well, anybody got anything else they want to say before we wrap it up here? Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Another an, another enlightening day. Yeah, definitely. Looking forward to next week. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night.